Hey everybody, welcome back to this live episode of Think Business. I'm looking forward, really looking forward to talking with Kara Golden, founder and CEO of Hint Inc., best known for its award-winning Hint Water, the leading unsweetened flavored water. Um, Kara, you have such an incredible background um, and, and, and backstory. You've been named one of InSile's Badass 50, Fast Company's Most Creative People in Business, Fortune's Most Innovative Women in Food and Drink, uh, and the um, e, uh, and the entrepreneur of the year uh, for Northern California, Huffington Post listed you as one of the six, six disruptors in business, alongside Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. You are an active speaker, active writer. Um, you have a new book that just came out in October, Undaunted. So we got a, we got a lot to talk about, and I appreciate you taking time to be on the show. But I, but I want to jump in and talk about where we sit today, January 6, 2021. We have, it has been quite a year in 2020. As we sit here in 2021, I want to start by asking you, how has your leadership changed since January of last year? I think that the first that that the thing that I most realized in coming into this year is that you you can't really clump a situation into uh, being you know the same as yesterday, right? Yeah. But in some ways, you can actually learn from history and figure out exactly how to move forward. So I, I'll never forget those last two weeks in, in March, including flying to New York and kind of hearing from my team in mid-March that uh, they were very uncomfortable going into the office. Yeah. And uh, and I live in the Bay Area and San Francisco. And, you know, frankly, I, I just don't think that it was really in California yet. I mean, it, yeah. it, we found out later that it kind of was in California, but we didn't really know it. And with, there was not this awareness that was going on in New York and, and it was clearly stressing and straining. And so as a leader, I think actually walking into that situation and feeling it and then coming back to my team and saying, you know, I think people should be working from home, at least in New York for right now. And let's actually figure out, you know, a little bit more about what's going on. But I think that the other piece of it too was realizing that we realized this in 2008, 2009, that being a little bit paranoid and having enough cash in the bank and yeah. doing what you can as a company to constantly be thinking, what if, even when the rest of your colleagues or, you know, in, in other companies in your industry are saying, wow, that's really crazy. Why wouldn't you save a little money by uh, getting cans or getting bottles from outside of the U.S. versus yeah. actually blowing all of your and, and making your supply chain totally in, in the U.S., which ended up to be, I mean, was pretty much gold by the time, right. I mean, while the rest of the world was shutting down at different times, we actually were able to um, really weather the storm um, quite nicely. So I think that the, the, I would say that the leadership lessons in particular were, um, you know, get in it with your team. Yeah. And actually, and especially when you don't understand, I, I think for me, I needed to get on a plane and go fly into it and actually see for myself. And that expanded, frankly, into uh, by the last week in March when we uh, suddenly knew this new term that we hadn't heard, which was called essential product. Yeah. Being an essential product, you actually have a responsibility as a manufacturer in the U.S., water, um, to manufacture 24 hours a day, keep the shelves um, stocked, all of those things. So while many people were hearing shelter in place, you, um, you'll be staying home, They're, maybe their husband or wives were staying home, I was saying to my team, actually, you're going to be working and here's your N95 masks and here's yeah. your gloves. And at some point, I thought, Again, I got to go there with them. I and so I actually went back to where what I was doing 15 years ago, which was taking on a route. Yeah. And I had a few Fun. people on my team say, 
really? You're going to you're going to go and take on a route while you're going to go into Target stores and be merchandising and in the middle of a pandemic. And I said, I am. And part of the reason why I wanted to do that was because I wanted to make sure that I was making the right decision Yeah. because I did not know what was out there. Yeah. And no one did. And I was very, very clear with my team that I had never been through a pandemic. And so I hoped I was doing the right thing, yeah. but I wasn't sure. But again, I think showing your realness, uh, maybe your fear a little bit yeah. to saying that I'm going to make this decision for us and I'm going to, and I'm going, to, it could evolve. As we go on. And what ended up happening, too, was that things like, you know, just tiny little strategies, including the fact that I started going into stores before seven o'clock in the morning. I went to the managers of Target and Whole Foods and some of the others. And I said, hey, would you mind if I come before the doors actually open? And they said, no, that's fine. And I said, great. And I felt more comfortable. And so I went back to my team and I said, hey, there's no people in the store before seven. If you get there, like, I don't know. I feel you guys do whatever you want, but that's yeah. my strategy. But so again, coming in with sort of, you know, the strategy, the C-suite, maybe thinking yeah. was something that my team valued. And, you know, as it didn't didn't sit there and continue to think, I, I think our CEO is, is trying to kill us. I yeah. mean, which was truly what a few of them even said to me. And I yeah. said, no, not really trying to do that. But I, I get where you're coming from. But seeing that you're going to go into the battlefield with them, yeah. um, I think is something that really separated the leaders uh, during this time in every single industry Absolutely. Yeah. from from those that, you know, really did not surface in the right way. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, you know, leading by example, I mean, it's not it's not what you preach, it's what you tolerate, which is one of my favorite things. Mm -hmm. But it's also leading by example. It's not what you say, it's what you do. Um, so kudos to you for really getting into really scary times and, um, and, 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 and being real. I think most, I think too many leaders today are not real and they've created this kind of image, you know, they have this external brand that is, that doesn't match the internal brand. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and that is a, that's a big disconnect. I think today, especially when people are buying into cultures and want to work for cultures of people who are real care about them. And uh, so kudos, I, I love that story. I, I think it's, it's so great. I want to talk to you a little bit about something you said about how you look at history. And, you know, we can look at history and learn a lot. And then we can make some assumptions when we look forwards. Pre-COVID studies were showing that 85% of the jobs that exist in the year 2030 don't exist today. So we're going through this decade of change. And COVID, I think, accelerated a lot of that. And so when you, when you look at just the landscape of, of business, how do we re how do we kind of rewind how are you rewinding reverse engineering studies like that to prep for where the world is going tomorrow well i think clearly uh, you know automation which i touched on a couple yeah. of minutes ago i mean i think that the more that you can automate anything uh, i think that you know, it's it ends up to be better. It ends up that during a pandemic, when you have a product like ours that yep. doesn't have preservatives in it, we've always been maybe a little paranoid about on our lines when we have eight different plants and on our lines when, you know, the bottle's getting filled and the fruit is, extract is going in, we don't have any preservatives. And so what if... Joe comes into work that day and he sneezes and people said, yeah, but it's tiny, you know, just like it. it and I said, yeah, maybe, but you don't have anything to kill it. Yeah. Right. Once it goes in the bottle. And again, we've never had an issue. So you never really know by the time it gets into a 16 ounce bottle, exactly what it's going to do. But I just thought, yeah, I don't like it. Let's, tr let's try and figure out if we can get rid of the people in the room. And so that's been our project and our 
chief operating officer was running that whole project. And I mean, we were joking for the last few years, almost like, you know, God, why are you so paranoid? I mean, we're down to one person in 2019 in the room. We're like, what are the chances? And he would not stop until it was at zero. Yeah. And so by the end of 2019, we had no people in the room. And we were like, you know, clapping, but then we were like, does it really matter? It ended up, it mattered a lot. So by the time March rolled around, we were in such a great position to not shut our factories down at all, like a lot of other factories, because wow. we had actually done this automation. And so I think that, that that would be the number one thing that I would be saying to businesses is, is there, think about your business and think about, well, first of all, look back in history and figure out like what, what happened this year? What was hard? Right. Instead of saying, uh, forget about 2020, I actually look back in history and say, well, you know, what happened? What could we do better? Own it. Right. Yeah. Own, own when you did not like think about it the right way. You weren't prepared, whatever it was and figure it out. And and I think that that is the number one thing. Yeah. And then figuring out, is there something here that I can be automating? Is there something else that I should be looking at and doing so that if another pandemic comes along or something else comes along that's scary? And that that's really the number one thing that I see. And I think it's across all, all industries, frankly. Yeah. I, uh, I, I love what you're, uh, what you're talking about, the systems, the processes, the automation. I, I have a question for you because what, what you're talking about also is listening to your instincts, listening to that, 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 that voice, listening to the extra, where I think 99 out of 100 people would have said, yeah, but it's fine the way it is. But something kind of pushed you to kind of keep on going, right? And so what is that extra little something? Because that little something is what, what separates the, the great from the exceptional and I think gets you on the list of being a disruptor along the sides of Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg. Looking forward, you know, one of my one of my favorite shows is uh, the Men That Built America. It's on mm -hmm. the History Channel. Have you have you seen it? I have. Yeah. I have. And it starts with Vanderbilt um, Vanderbilt selling his ships, knowing that there's going to be uh, moving to railroads. But he did. There wasn't Uber. You know, there wasn't anything in front of him to direct him. And so he had to make decisions, tough decisions and changes when he didn't know what was in front of him. And so for you, you didn't know COVID was in front of you, but you listened to your gut and your instincts and you pushed it and your team got on board. And so just kind of in, infused some empowerment in people to, to do more of that. Yeah, I think it's it, it's also infusing uh, this this concept that actually I learned in the tech industry in the mid 90s from the little startup that I was working in that was in Steve Jobs uh, idea that spun out of Apple, uh, but that ideas can come from anywhere. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter whether you're an engineer or you're the person sweeping the floors, you look at a at a situation or a problem and you are brainstorming about it and and that as long as you can participate and you can think it doesn't really matter i mean in this case if you went to college if you went to stanford business school whatever your ideas were actually looked at as are they you know peaking another idea that's going to um you know satisfy curiosity whatever and or or spur curiosity, more curiosity. And so I think that's the thing that I think about a lot is that unfortunately the problem happens, these big ideas don't actually get incubated when, you know, for example, you've got a bunch of people sitting at Coca-Cola trying to come up with innovation. Yeah. Innovation doesn't happen because they're all, you know, the same right? And they're all talking to each other all day long. And there's no ideas The the ideas come from people who come into an industry when there's when they have questions and they're just acting as, you know, regular consumers. Right. And and they're you know, it's like you asked me. So wait, how how does a bottle of hint actually get produced? 
you're a smart person, right? But you you just haven't lived in it, right? And right. so that was how I really looked at my at you know this problem. What I didn't know was that the being intelligent and then jumping in and asking these questions, you just you just keep asking more questions. And yeah. I mean, I couldn't figure out, for example, why a product didn't have preservatives in it. Or uh, I mean, everything that I saw out there had had preservatives. And I thought, can't we have a product without preservatives in it? Yeah. And like, why do we need preservatives? And yeah. no one had the answer. And so I said, I don't know. I just don't really want preservatives. So how do we do that? And, and everybody I talked to, 99% of the people I talked to said, because you can't. Yeah. And that to me is not an answer. I don't know. Maybe I, I like bothered my parents too much and they would say, <laughs> they would say no. And I'd say, why? You know, yeah. I mean, all of those kind of things come along to sort of train you and to think about this. But again, I think if you're so often we, we opt ourselves out because we think, oh, I don't have experience when actually it's counter to that, to what is needed. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, I think that that's the, that's the really the biggest thing that people uh, should be thinking about. It's interesting. I, I worked at the end of the Obama administration. I was invited into this committee. There were 30 of us that were invited in to uh, focus for two years on, uh, on spurring entrepreneurs and throughout the country. And uh, Obama actually picked 30 entrepreneurs from all different um, walks of life, including me. And uh, we, you know, we sat in a room and one of the projects that I was tasked to think about was recycling. And what was it, it you know, that was, that was missing? And, uh, and it was interesting because I also worked alongside this guy, Joe, who was living in West Virginia, and he was looking at how to bring former coal miners back into the workforce mm -hmm. because the coal mine. And so I, at first I thought, now what in the world are Joe and I going to be talking about here? Yeah. And then all of a sudden I was just sitting, I mean, he spurred so many ideas and so right. many thoughts. And I, and that really goes back to this original comment that I made about what I learned in the mid nineties, that I really think that the tech industry uh, really has, has been probably the most uh, active in kind of thinking about that ideas can come from anywhere. Yeah. And, and that is, it is so central to every single industry, I believe. Yeah, I love it. I love it. All right. Um, I love every word that you're saying. And I want to shift to um, women um, in the boardroom. I want to talk about uh, this year, studies show that um, Fortune 500 um, women uh, equate to 7% last year and it will get to 8% this year. I have a 14, soon to be 15 year old daughter that I know is going to do things that are going to change the world. Um, and I want to make sure, and, and, and one, thank you for pi being a pioneer for the daughters of, of all of us um, to, to, um, to have somebody to look up to and know that, that everything is possible. But what, how do we get that 8% higher? What, what can women do and what can men do? So much to say about this and so many <laughs> feelings about it too. I, so... First of all, I I think that there there's a balance between uh, listening and understanding that there's this issue out there where the number is low, and also just plowing forward. And so, if in you know in my book, I I call them you know doubts and doubters. It's like when you start to pick up on you know the fact that it's a small percentage and you're smart, you're like, oh, that's really small. So the odds are against me. I get that. But then the more you start to articulate that, you're going to bring those doubters in, right? People are going to think, oh, gosh, yeah, there's, there's no way that this is going to be possible. And so I think that instead of focusing, doesn't mean that you can't recognize that the number is there, but move forward. Yeah. And it's your job. And I really do 
believe this and I feel this and own this every single day that if I don't show up and I don't go do the things that I need to do, including being part of, of the Obama administration too, I, you know, I'm a mother of four, a CEO. Did I have time for it? No. But I said, you know what? I'm going to make time. I'm going to yeah. figure this out to do it because it's my responsibility. And that's how I feel about, um, you know, a lot of what you're talking about there too, is that it is my responsibility where I get nervous though. And I have, um, for Gen Zers that are sitting in my house is that I think, and I'm of the Gen X generation, I think that we've got this group in between the Gen Xers and the Gen Zers that feels, many of them, that they've been sold a bill of goods, right? And I think that what we've seen in the pandemic is that many of those millennials have left these large cities, have with a lot of debt, have, you know, tons of student loans. They signed up for that tech job that they took a lower salary at to get more stock and they got screwed in some way, or, you know, they went to a large city and they didn't like that. And, and, and so I feel what I get most nervous about is that I think that there's, uh, there are a lot of millennials and and particularly women that are potentially opting out in some way and we haven't done a great job in in trying to figure out instead we're saying oh they're just millennials right yeah. we haven't been, we haven't tried to figure out how do i pull them up because i don't really think that they're getting pulled up in the right way i don't have it figured out yet yeah. but i know that and, and again, as I've been sheltering in place, I've been having this conversation with my kids that I, I'm not going to be their manager. And that's why I care about this, that I feel like I still have time, for example, to basically share with, with millennials that it wasn't easy. I did, I, if you read my book, you'll see a lot of people have said, look, you had your doubts, you had your failures in there. You talk so honestly yeah. about that and about the stuff that you gave up, about the stuff that you had some success, but then you also said that there was stuff that happened that you know you didn't like along the way too. And why don't more people talk about that stuff? Yeah. And, said, and I don't think that Gen X does that as well. And I, and I don't think that I'll go as far as to say that I think that there's more male leaders who talk about that. I don't think the female leaders talk about it in the same way to say like that happened and here's what I learned from it, et cetera. But anyway, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting time. And, and I think that it's, uh, as we hopefully come out of this pandemic, I'm, I'm hoping to really try and figure that out a little bit more and and think on it but i i do worry i do worry about it well i love that you're thinking and um i will continue to think as much as i can if, if whatever <laughs> and talk to my daughter about it as well so i think it's great let's talk about your book a little bit more um uh let's let's talk about the book so um undaunted what tell us about the title yeah. So, well, first of all, I, I call myself an accidental entrepreneur, but I also call myself an accidental author because I didn't know I was writing a book when I wrote this book. I, it was my journal that I was writing for the last four years. And I was spending a ton of time on planes and in hotel rooms across the country. And instead of turning on the TV, I would start writing and I would write about, I was doing a ton of public speaking and, and sometimes people would ask me questions and I would get kind of stumped about something and think, okay, let me think about a story that would really kind of articulate exactly what the best answer is for this. And so as I started to write this out about two and a half years into it, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a, an author and I said, you know, how would I bind this, these notes into some sort of format I wasn't even calling it a book. I said it so, so that I could just give it to people so that they could learn from my mistakes. 
and and maybe know that it seemed really hard and really confusing, but actually that was a big lesson that I learned in order to do what we're doing today. And she she misunderstood me and said, what do you mean, like a publisher or an agent? And I said, maybe, I don't know. I, I'm just thinking about like actually putting it into some sort of format that it will yeah. be for people to get. And that's when, um, you know, I, I figured out that I'm, I've got a book and what I, what I really, I led with doing it because I felt like it would help people, which frankly is probably the last 20 years of my life. You know, in many ways, how I think about things, um, even if they're hard, I think I, I, I always talk about that. I never thought about this as a beverage company when I had seen that by giving up diet soda and drinking water, that it made me tremendously healthier, not just like unobvious, but obvious. I mean, I, I lost in two and a half weeks, I lost over 20 pounds. I mean, it was significant. I thought, wait, we have all these people that are on diets all over the world and spending lots of money doing this. And yet it's more about go do this versus stop doing that. Yeah. And, and, and instead start drinking water. My problem was, is I was bored with water. I, I should, I grew up in Arizona. I should have been drinking a ton of water. I never did because I just didn't love the taste. Yeah. And so, so when I figured out for me how to get healthy, then I thought if I could go and launch this beverage, we could not only get people to drink water, but big diseases like type two diabetes, which were just cropping up about 15 years ago. I did this because I thought, that would be, that's my mark. If I can actually help people get healthy in the world, mm. that's not only pretty damn cool for me, but also for my family. That's the mom. That is the mark that I wanted to make in, in my life. And so yeah. when I started to really think about, you know, that, and, and I think that was one of the first times that I, when I was thinking about Hint, where I just really thought about what's my legacy. And I think that that was what I thought about this book too, that all the people that I would talk to often on, you know, LinkedIn, or they would hear about my story and write to me and they maybe loved Hint. Some of them had never tried it. I thought if I could actually just let people know a little bit more that I had no experience in the beverage industry. I had no idea what I was doing. I sat there and followed people in Whole Foods who looked official and said, hey, are you a distributor? And they'd say no. And I'd say, oh, well, do you know any? You know, I mean, I, I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah, that's great. You know? And meanwhile, like sometimes I was even strolling my cart through the aisles. I mean, it was like a scene as, as my husband says, you know, we would have made a lot more money if we actually like started rolling the cameras. I mean, the stuff, but I also thought it was fun yeah, right? and it was hysterical. And, you know, I would go to like 15 years ago, I'd be invited to dinner parties and I would tell my friends in tech and they'd be like, wait, what are you doing? Oh my God, this is hysterical. And I said, yeah, the, the guys from Pepsi, they threw my product out in the garbage dumpster. Like I saw the guy doing it. Yeah. And he was like, what did you do? And I said, I went up to him and I said, how can you do that? And he said, watch me. And I was just like, wait, don't do this. And But again, I just thought that the whole, I didn't know this world is, existed. Yeah, And it was just bizarre to me, but also... It was, it, I mean, it was educational to me in many ways too. And I think like, that's the one other thing that I would say too, which is almost a book in and of itself. I just actually launched a piece on this today on, on LinkedIn about the importance of learning. Yeah. Somewhere along the way, I believe we, we sort of, maybe college is the last time where we're taught that, you know, you get a job and then you go become a manager and then maybe some of you will actually become a CEO of a company. And unfortunately, that journey is gets less and less about learning and more and more about teaching. Yeah. And so the most unhappy people today are sitting in the highest levels of our companies, often our government, right, where they're just telling people what to do. Yeah. And and 
I think that that for me was here, I'm managing a group of 200 people at, you know, my last job prior to Hint uh, at, at America Online. And that was, I should have been happy. And I wasn't happy. And I, I go back to looking at the fact that I wasn't learning. Yeah. And it wasn't a priority to me to learn either. And that's what I was so engaged with when I started learning about the beverage industry. And there were tons of people around me saying like, really beverages? Like you're in tech. I mean, you're, you got stock options, you're making money, you know, like what, what are you doing? Yeah. And I, and I said, I, I don't know. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm actually enjoying myself every single day. And I make yeah. you laugh because you're listening to my horrible stories about my product getting thrown in the dumpster and it's all, you know, yeah. and, and so anyway, but I think that no matter what industry you're in and I think, and maybe you're sitting inside of a role today where, you know, you should be happy, but you're not happy. Try and figure out if you're learning and yeah. if you're not learning, that could be one of the top things that yeah. it needs to change. That's so well said. I, I, what, a quote that changed my life was success minus fulfillment equals failure. I had a great corporate job. I wasn't happy. I wasn't fulfilled. I always wanted to be a business coach. I wanted to write books. I wanted to speak. I wanted to coach companies, uh, mm -hmm. coach people. My dad, when I was 18, gave me a set of tapes. That's by Brian Tracy, Kara, called The Psychology of Success. And he said, you'll learn more from these than you, people than you will college. And I became obsessed ever since, and that was 30 years ago. And, I love it. Uh, and and so to me, I agree with you. There is not a day that goes by that I don't do something to kind of grow my learning. And I find that my in my coaching business, I'm coaching a lot of the people you're talking about because they are they they don't have anybody to talk to. They're lonely. They're they're stuck, and um, and they need to get unstuck. So I agree with you. I think learning is is absolutely critical, and. Um, and I wish more companies put it as a, as a top priority and saw it as an investment and not an expense. So I think that's that's great. I, I love your story. Um, I, I love talking to you. Uh, are you ready for a quick speed round? Yeah. All right. Um, favorite book and why? Well, the book I'm reading right now that I kind of touched on is called Can't Even. And it's uh, and it's how millennials became the burnout generation. Oh wow! And, and it's it's quite good. And I actually interviewed um, her name is Ann Peterson. I interviewed her on my podcast, and I, you know, and I dug in a little bit more again because I I feel, you know, can I can while I can can I have impact? Can I change and yeah. help? And, and I think it's important. And, and so anyway, that's one of the better ones. That's great. Oh, good. I, I'm reading a book right now, which I love, uh, Cast, which uh, if, you, if you haven't read it, it's... Uh, right on my pile. It's right incredible. There. It's incredible. Yeah. We're actually doing a family, we're doing a family book club with... Uh, oh, really? Yeah, we're all reading it. And then we're, I think we're talking tomorrow about the book and it's uh it's that's a good idea it should be a must read for, for everybody it's that's amazing. a great idea yeah. yeah uh best piece of wisdom you've ever received uh you can't actually do it if you don't try <laughs> that's a good one uh, one piece of advice you would give people in college excuse me one piece of advice you would give somebody graduating college today Go out and find what you love. Yeah, I love it. Uh, and uh, can I add just one or two sentences? Yeah, of course, of course. I think that the that part, one of the chapters in my book that I talk about that a lot of people have been pretty surprised about is that I didn't actually have recruiters come on campus uh, uh, that I wanted to talk to. And so I invested in myself and bought a plane ticket and I told every single person that came within, I waitressed when I was in college, any person that would talk to me, I would tell them that I'm going on this tour and I made the tour a lot bigger, but I told them I was going to LA and San Francisco and Chicago. I knew I wanted to live in a big city. I had over 90 interviews. 
in one month. And I had over 60 job offers coming out of college. That's great. And, and so, and people always ask, did you have all these recruiters? Did you, you know, and I said, no, I just, I told everybody and people want to help that people yeah. are actually, they do want to help. And especially people who are older than you, they yeah. want to help you. And those entry level positions are the ones that people are trying to find the great people that want to work. Yeah. I love it. I love that story. Last question. Define yourself in one word. Curious. All right. Kara, tell everybody uh, how they can get your book uh, and any contact information uh, that you want to give away. Thank you. So it's Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters, bookstores everywhere, Amazon, Audible, et cetera. And uh, of course, you have to have a hint with your your bottle of, uh, with a bottle of hint with Undaunted, uh, which is our drink. And uh, yeah, I'm all over social media at Kara Golden and please stop by and hopefully we'll get to meet it some, someday soon. I appreciate it. Kara, I appreciate you taking time to talk to me. I wish you all the best on your book. Um, and I just, uh, you're, you're a great example of leading by example. Thank uh, you so and, much. And, you know, I think people learn through authenticity of stories and lessons and you just through how you and I spoke, um, you know, you just kind of ooze that very freely um, and generously. So I, I appreciate that. And I know I probably can speak for many people who probably feel the same way. So I appreciate you being on the show. Thanks. I love I love your products. I love your wisdom and I love everything that you shared today. So thank you. Thank you so much. The Think community, thanks for joining us. Go get some hint water and uh, and go get undaunted on Amazon.com. All right. Thanks, everybody.